Hey everybody, and welcome to Amy Nolte Music. About two years ago, a man who lived in Long Island named Freddie Wexler had a doctor who was friends with Billy Joel's doctor, and his wife somehow arranged a meeting between the two of them. Freddie Wexler wanted one thing. I mean, he, probably two. He want, probably wanted to meet Billy Joel, get to know him, and also for him to write again. It had been 30 years since Billy Joel had released any new music officially, and Freddie's mission was to make it happen, to write more music with Billy Joel, Freddie being a producer and a composer himself. So over the next year and a half or so, they got to know each other. They bounced ideas off of each other. Billy Joel gave Freddie Wexler a, a recording, a whole bunch of recordings of everything that he's written, little pieces of things that he thinks might be, you know, worth something someday. And after sifting through it and probably just countless conversations about how life has been and how Billy feels about everything, Freddie presented Billy Joel with the song Turn the Lights Back On. And I want to think that Freddie Wexler was astute enough and sensitive enough to include I don't exactly know how much they collaborated, but I like to think that he took exactly what was in Billy's heart because, you know, Billy signed off on it and recorded it. And and so to me, it's a it's a true collaboration, 30 years in the making, and I'd like to dive into it and see what's behind it a little bit and talk about the question that I think Billy Joel is asking himself and maybe asking us as well. I've got to say that on the first listen to this song, I thought it was pretty good. I was like, yeah, that's a good song. And I, I listened closely to the lyrics and I tried to just kind of take it all in. And at that point, I hadn't seen the official music video because it didn't, didn't come out at the same time that the song did. But now that I'm making this video, I probably have only heard it six or seven times. And one of those times I, I transcribed it um, but I love it now. It took a little time, but it's, um, I think it's gorgeous. And I actually can't sing it all the way through without tearing up. So that's, that's something. It's powerful. Um, the lyric is, is beautiful. Um, uh, please, uh, excuse my piano if it's a little out of tune. The tuner's coming in a couple days, but I really wanted to make the video. Please open the door. Nothing is different, we've been here before. Do you recognize about the song right off the bat that it's in 6-8? 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1. Not many songs, not many pop songs are written in 6-8. You could probably also think of it in 3 or maybe in 12. Um, I liked 6 when I went to write it down. And so you get this little lilt. One, It's, it's almost like some kind of a hymn, and it also almost reminds me of something else by Billy Joel. I, I can't quite put my finger on it, uh, but it, it sounds very Billy Joel, doesn't it? And when we get to this part, you, I'm sure you all thought it when you heard it for the first time, that this absolutely reminds you of Cat Stevens' Morning is Broken, um, and it does, and I'm going to talk about that later. But... I want to say that we, we're in the key of C. We have we have the one chord, and he's playing it in the in the second inversion because I always say chords sound best right in the middle of the piano, especially when you're accompanying a singer, and he is accompanying himself. So, yeah, th these chords sound great here. And then first inversion of an F chord, and then G right in root position, inversion of an E chord, and then we're gonna we're gonna have the bass climb up. Billy Joel knows that if you want chords to have power you have to have some slash chords because there's so much meaning in what a bass note does and how a bass note goes from chord to chord, right? Please open the door. Nothing is different. We've been there before. Imagine if it just stayed right there. It would have been okay, but he changed it from E to E7. We've been here before. Pacing the halls. It, 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 almost, it almost sounds like pacing. Two, three, four, five. 
trying to talk. And we've got the same note that's in the melody in the bass. Over the silence. And then we just repeat it. There's a little walk down, F to E minor. Pride sticks out his tongue, laughs at the portrait that we become. Pride sticks out its tongue. That's kind of brutal. And it's not a lyric that you would normally hear somebody write. Um, it's It takes some thought to write that. Like, Billy Joel is the master of that. He's a master of telling a story and of actually, like, making you think through what's going on. And if you're, if you're saying, I mean, the beginning line of this song is, please open the door. Somebody has locked him out. Nothing's different. We've been here before. We're pacing the halls. We're trying to talk over the silence. I mean, this is a bad relationship. Something is stagnant. Something is um, not moving. And then he thinks to say that pride sticks out its tongue. Laughs at the portrait that we've become. Stuck in a frame. Like maybe he's... It makes me think he's locked out and he's stuck in the hallway looking at a picture of them. Unable to change. And then he says... I was wrong. And that makes me think that maybe it's something he hasn't been able to say before, or maybe he's grown up enough now to be able to say that he was wrong. And when the chorus starts, he says that he's late. I'm late, but I'm here right now. And this is where we hear what is kind of reminiscent of Morning Has Broken. Um, of course, you can't copyright a chord progression. You can't even copyright arpeggios. Um, and I don't think that it follows the chord progression long enough for that to even be in question, really. And, you know, Billy Joel plays arpeggios all the time. This is just, you know, it's just a pattern that maybe Mozart or, or Bach invented. It's, a, it's actually a little hard to play while you sing. And I do hear... Um, I, I hear two notes at the beginning of these. Boom, boom, boom. But, okay, this is what I think about Morning Has Broken. The song is called Turn the Lights Back On. And he's trying to make it happen again, whatever it is. It, it, and he did, he said in, in his interview, here, listen to him say it with Howard Stern. It's a woman, right? Partly, yes. There's a double meaning to it. What do you mean? Part of it is about a relationship, and part of it is about my own my own life. Like, uh, is it too late to turn? I'm putting out a new record. Wait a minute, do I get a, a second chance here? So it's both. It's about some relationship, and it's about his career or music. And if he's trying to turn the lights back on, why not make a little nod to Cat Stevens' "Morning Has Broken." Like, that's what he wants to happen, right? He wants it to be morning again. So I think that's beautiful. And I, I don't know that he did it consciously, but I, I kind of feel like he probably did. Um, so he, he says, it's late, but I'm here right now, though I used to be romantic. That's something you don't see coming. Like people, you know, writing song lyrics, they just say things like, like, I used to be in love, or I, I, we used to go for walks, or he just pulls it all out. I, I used to be romantic, I forgot somehow. And then, I don't know, I already said something was my favorite, but I love, like, he could have just gone, I forgot somehow. He could have just rested, but he didn't just rest. He goes, I forgot somehow. Time can make you blind. So he keeps singing through that phrase when I thought he was just going to rest. He keeps singing and it launches him into the second chorus. Time can make you blind. And now it's like you repeat back and, and the words are not the same. I'm late. But I see you now. Now the next line is kind of nuts. I see you now as we're laying in the darkness. Now how are you going to see somebody if you're laying in the darkness? Like does it mean that they're lying in bed together 
she's asleep. He's looking at her. I mean, if, if, if it's in the darkness, how is he going to see her? And so I don't think it means that. I think it means that enough time has passed that he's recognized what he's done, how whatever, how complacent he's been, how absent he's been. It, it could even be, you know, about one of his kids, right? But he's grown up enough to see this person now. And so I think that's cool that they're laying in the darkness. People probably don't really think about that. And, and then he asks what I think is the most important question of the song. Did I wait too long to turn the lights back on? And I don't think that we get an answer. And I wonder what he thinks about that and if he even knows. When you listen to that Howard Stern interview, Howard Stern keeps saying, like, who would you write it about? Who you, you know, what, what's going to happen? Like, are you going to, you know, th th this, this guy came and found Billy Joel, right? And, and begged him to write another song and helped him to find it within himself to write another song. And Howard Stern's trying to find out, Billy Joel, is an album coming? And all Billy Joel can say is, I don't know. Now, Billy Joel didn't write a song for 30 years, right? Now he performed. Man can sell out Madison Square Garden anytime he wants for the old songs. But what about a new song? Can he turn the lights back on in his career in, in, this, in this way that has to do with composing? And I think it's a big question. Howard Stern asked him, is there an album to follow? And he just says, you know, I really don't know. And I think that this song was just him starting to flip that switch to try to turn the light back on and and he doesn't know if it's gonna take and I I don't want to say what I'm gonna say right now but I went to look it up on Spotify because you know Spotify refreshes and every time like everybody has a top five songs that people listen to, you know, and every time that a song overtakes another song in streams, you know, the number five drops off the list and you don't even see what it is. All five songs on Billy Joel's Spotify today, which is in the middle of February, you know, he's released the song a couple weeks ago. This song is not in the top five. It breaks my heart. It's all the favorites. It's the ones that people have going, been going to Madison Square Garden to hear. And this one is not there. So I just have to wonder, like, what's that going to do to him? Like, for me, I've, I've put out four albums now, and whenever I write a song, and, and they don't come often, but whenever I feel like I've got something in me that needs to come out, I'm just going to make it because I'm not very famous, and what do I have to lose, right? I, if I want to make something, I'm going to make it because it's in me and I want it to be out of me. Billy Joel might have a fear of if he makes something, maybe not many people are going to listen to it. And I know I'm doing like a big rant right now and I'm not playing this piano, but the same thing for like Paul McCartney, if you look, like it's not his recent albums that are on the top five and he makes recent albums. He makes albums all the time with good songs on them, but I don't know. I don't know what it is. I think it might be a fear of that kind of thing. It might be a fear that he's too old, which is really sad. Like that people over whatever, 40 or something, maybe just can never have a top 10 hit again. Um, and I'm sure it's just eating him and it's been eating at him for 30 years probably. And then he tries and, and I mean, this song is a masterpiece. It's like, it's as good as anything he ever wrote, I think. And if you haven't come to that in your own head about this song, I recommend that you actually get the sheet music or something. It, I'm sure it exists. Um, actually, it probably exists like with the melody be being played, you know, um, like. I don't think that will make you love the song. I think you need to play it and sing it, or I think you need to learn the words and sing along with it and start to, st start to peel back the layers of what this song contains. Let's go back to the next verse. Now we get a little bit of a glimpse about maybe their house. Here, stuck on a hill, outsiders inside the home that we build. How horrible must that feel? I can't imagine. The cold settles in and he's painting a picture, like a visual picture. It's been a long winter of indifference. That's so sad. And I think that's, I mean, maybe it's both of them, whoever he's talking about, but I get the feeling it's probably him. And in him recognizing his indifference, maybe he's hoping that she's going to give him a chance. Maybe you love me. 
Maybe you don't. Maybe you'll learn to. Maybe you won't. You've had enough, but I won't give up on you. I mean, I think that's the most hopeful line of the song. Um, that even though he's screwed up and she's locked him out in whatever way she has, he's not going to give up on it. And if we look at the music and we let ourselves think about this music video where um, they hired some company to, to use a different kind of AI that generated Billy Joel at different stages of his life playing through this song, I think we get a message of hope there too, that he's not going to give up on himself. And isn't it beautiful to watch him playing and singing this song as a much younger man? And who knows when his problem started of being indifferent, um, shutting people out, uh, not taking the time to, you know, develop whatever relationship he's talking about. Who knows when that started? Might have been when the young, young Billy Joel was playing. Might, it might have been when the next Billy Joel was playing. But somewhere in there, he lost that spark in himself that used to be romantic. And then... Here's something that I think is, is something that a seasoned composer would do. It's when the chorus comes around the next time. Now, he could say the same lyrics that he's already said. He, he's got the chorus repeats twice every time. And the first time we heard two different sets of lyrics. He could do them again. They're good enough. They're strong enough. And it bears repeating. He changes everything. And he says, he, again, he says, I'm late, but I'm here right now. That's a, that's a huge line. I'm late, but I'm here. I'm trying to find the magic that we lost somehow. This is also hopeful to me that he's um, he's starting to put in the work that it's going to take to win her back, uh, or the work that it's taking that it took him to actually compose a song. I've, I mean, I've heard that he he doesn't really like to compose, and it, it maybe it scares him in a way. But in composing this song, he's trying to find the magic that he lost somehow. I think that's great. And then he says again, Maybe I was blind, but I see you now. This is all the same. As we're laying here in the darkness, did I wait too long? turn the lights back on and, and right when we get to here this is where we get the bridge this is where we get some epic piano playing from billy joel let's talk about this bridge so he says to turn the lights back on and then it goes to an a minor chord this is the harmony of the bridge boom boom to d to g to c which now feels like it's the four chord because it feels like we're in g and then we go to F to A minor, and now it feels like we're g coming back to C. That's that's the harmony of the bridge, but what he does with his right hand is magic. Um, to turn the lights back on, then he goes. How nice is that? That's so fast right here. And it's just, a, it's just C pentatonic, and it's like a Floyd Kramer kind of thing. Right? I have a whole video about that. When we get to the D chord, he does the Floyd Kramer again, and then he... He does... Now he's kind of D pentatonic. And then up to G. That's different than what he did before. It's kind of hard to play. But it's also... It's also G pentatonic, just about. Then he repeats up high, and then the strings come in, and it does it again. Let's listen to that. I think it sounds nice to add sixths if you want to make it a little more beautiful. And we go back for the end of the song. And this is where we kind of notice, and I'm going to be honest, I didn't really notice this until... I wrote it down and we went back to the beginning of the song that actually, you know, please open the door, nothing is different, we've been here before, is the exact same as I'm late but I'm here right now, and I used to be romantic. They're the same chord changes. So, so he goes back and plays it like this. 
but this time he's actually singing like words more like they're the chorus. And, and he improvises the melody. I can't do it exactly like he does. I haven't listened quite enough, but let's listen to him do it. I'm late, but I'm here right now. I'm late, but I'm here right now. Is there still time for forgiveness? Is there still time for forgiveness? Won't you tell me how I can't read your mind? That's a, that's pleading. Please tell me to, how to do it. I can't read your mind. But I see you now. He says it again. As we're laying in the darkness, did I wait too long to turn the lights back on? And then as it ends, he just repeats these lines, but he repeats them so powerfully. And how about Billy Joel's voice? Like if you watch that music video and you see him as older Billy Joel, and then you see him as younger Billy Joel, I don't think you're phased. Like, I don't think you look at that young Billy Joel with the older Billy Joel voice and think, oh, that his voice, you know, it's changed. Like if it was Paul McCartney, right? Paul McCartney's voice has changed quite a bit. And if you saw a young Paul McCartney with his voice now, I don't think it would work, but somehow Billy Joel's voice just sounds like 100 on this song. He just hasn't lost it. He hasn't lost it. It's pristine, it's gorgeous, it's in tune. Um, his fall-offs are amazing, his attacks are great, his, his phrasing seasoned and lovely. I can't say enough about that, but I do just wanna say that this song has touched me um, because I think it's beautiful that he's trying to put something back together that he's lost whether it's a relationship or whether it's himself and and he's scared about the future of his music. He tried. For music, maybe he has some control about whether it's too late or whether it's not too late to turn the lights back on and give it another shot and compose again and maybe put out a whole new album. Like, if he wants to work really hard and dig within himself, um, he can make it as good as he can make it and if the pub, however the public deals with that, I mean, then it's out of his control, right? He's got a little bit of control right there, but I have a feeling that with the relationship that he's trying to get back, it feels like it's completely in her court. Like he's scratching and clawing and trying his hardest to make his way back, but I don't think he knows. I might be wrong, but that's how the song feels to me. I don't think he knows if it's too late. And that's why he asks it so many times. Did he wait too long? And in this interview, listen to him talk about regret with Howard Stern. I think this is amazing. In life, I have no, no regrets. regrets, which is absurd. Anybody who's really lived must have regrets. I mean, I owe a thousand apologies to thousands of people. Me too. Uh, I have lots of regrets. Yes, of course. How can you live a life with no regrets? I, I don't believe that. So I wanted to respond to it. With this uh, song, Turn the Lights Back On. I don't know the answers that Billy Joel has found since he released this song. I don't know how he feels about it exactly. But I think that the question he's asking, if he waited too long, and if there's anything he can do to fix the absence of himself in music for the last 30 years, I think he's done it with this song. I mean, I think that he took a step, a major step. He wrote a beautiful song, released a beautiful song that is a step toward what could be more. And I think that there will be more. That's my gut feeling. I have no idea about the relationship he's trying to repair or relationships he's trying to repair. I can't speculate on that at all. I hope, I hope that in both places there's room for him at the age that he is with the wisdom that he has and all of the music that is still inside of him to step in and take his place again. And honestly, thinking about music like this is my very favorite thing in the world. Being able to hear these chords and transcribe them and know the inversion of the chord and to hear the bass notes is all something I talk about in the courses that I teach on the platform Nebula. Nebula is a platform much like Netflix, but it's all educational content. Lots of creators like me put educational content on Nebula. 
I've created four classes on Nebula. One is about how to create motifs, like a motif, like when you open a song, like Billy Joel's opening motif here is That's his opening motif. I don't know exactly how he came up with it, but I know exactly how to teach you to find a motif like that within yourself, whether you're writing a song or improvising a solo. I've actually got 13 steps, 13 things you can try yourself to be able to, to come up with a meaningful motif to open whatever you're writing or improvising on. And I've got two more classes. It's a, it's a two-part class called Everything I Know About Chords part one and part two. That's the stuff I'm talking about, being able to hear the chords, being able to feel the difference between the qualities of the chords, like major and minor, and to be able to hear what dissonance sounds like if you add different notes to different chords, what it feels like, how you can know how to name those chords, and how you can understand the bass movement in slash chords. I start right at the beginning. If you don't know how to build a chord at all, start with part one. By the time you're done with part two, you're going to be right up there with uh, Brian Wilson and Paul McCartney and uh, Carol King and, well, you know, Keith Jarrett, people who really know about harmony. I've also got a brand new series on Nebula, and it's called Quarter Notes with Amy Nolte, where I have musicians right here in my house. And as we play solos and duets, I stop them and I say, what is that chord? What are you doing right there? How did you think of that? Please, let's talk about it. We have discussions about music and, and we talk about the piano in particular. My first guest was Larry Goldings. It's a beautiful interview. Watch a little bit of it. I'm thinking about Duke Ellington mm -hmm. and the kind of um, crunchy chords that he might... Um... Can you show me a couple of those? Yeah, like... It's like an a whole step above one of the degrees, but you've voiced it in the, in the bottom. Yeah. That sounds great. Even if you signed up for Nebula, just for me, for my content, at 30 bucks for the entire year, it's a heck of a bargain. Like you couldn't even get one of these classes for under $100 if you just paid for an online course, but they're all in the same spot on Nebula. $30 with my code gets you the whole platform plus all of the great content from other creators that you already know and love, like Adam Neely and Charles Cornell and Polyphonic and Listening In and Mary Spender, and also creators who don't do music as well on a vast array of other educational subjects. Click the code that you see right here or in the description of this video, and the deal is yours. Hey, thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for loving Billy Joel with me. I can feel your love through the camera. I'll see you next time on Amy Nolte Music.